Welcome to uh, Matson Baptist Church, wherever you are. This morning we begin a uh, four-part series uh, titled Prophecies of the Coming Kingdom. And they're all taken from the book of Isaiah in the Old Testament. Uh, I'm sure you'll recognize some of the passages uh, because we use them regularly uh, as part of our, our, Christian, our Christmas services. As well as the usual um, hymns and reading and, and prayers and of course the, the sermon, um, Margaret will be leading us in communion this morning so please be prepared for that uh, in, in the usual way. Let's pray together briefly. Father, though today we are in many different places, yet we are together in your presence. Bless our time of worship and learning, we pray. By your Spirit, enliven our praise and teach us from your Word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And our worship begins with a well-known hymn, Rejoice, the Lord is King. Today's reading comes from the book of the prophet Isaiah and chapter 9, beginning at verse 2. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest as men rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. 
For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Thanks be to God. This uh, talk is, is uh, entitled uh, uh, The Future King and uh, it, it centres really on uh, Isaiah and uh, his uh, early experience as uh, a prophet to King Ahaz. Um, we had a reading from Isaiah already this morning. I think uh, in, in difficult times, uh, when things go wrong or we feel things are tough, um, let, let's, let's say, uh, like the present uh, co coronavirus pandemic we're in at the moment, I think very often we, we have two feelings about it. The first very natural one is, I wish this was all over uh, and as quickly as possible. Uh, and the second one, if we're more thoughtful, is, well, is, are there any lessons here? Um, and are there any long-term solutions which uh, mean that we don't have to go through all this again? You, you could look at, as an illustration, that's something like the First World War. Uh, everybody hated it, at least uh, once it began, began to drag out. And all they wished for was that it could be over. Uh, and uh, when it was over, they were, they were very pleased. But at the same time, 
there were people who came up with the slogan, was this a war to end all wars? Wouldn't it be nice if we could say, we're, we're never going to do this again? Are, are there ways which we could think uh, and, and things that we could do which would prevent wars happening at all? The Old Testament prophets tended to think in that sort of way. They certainly addressed the situations in which they found themselves at the time. But they also had a wider vision, or a longer vision perhaps. They thought, wouldn't it be great if we could find uh, something which, which would uh, deal with this situation permanently? For example, um, Isaiah uh, had to put up with a, a bad king, King Ahaz. And he, he, he ministered to Ahaz. He had something to say to him, that's for sure. But at the same time, you feel that in his prophecies there's this yearning for a king who would be such a good king that... Um, they never have another worry. Um, let's, let's look at the situation which is described in Isaiah chapter 7. Ahaz was king of Judah, the small southern half of the two kingdoms which split up after King Solomon. And uh, Judah was being attacked by its two northern neighbours, uh, Ephraim or Israel and uh, Syria. And uh, they were in trouble. The, the Syrians had already uh, begun to invade. And the two forces posed against them were a lot stronger than the one uh, defence force that they could muster. And, and we read um, uh, dramatically in, in chapter 7, I think it's verse 2, uh, we read, When word reached the king of Judah that the armies of Syria were already in the territory of Israel. He and all his people were so terrified that they trembled like trees shaken in the wind. Very graphic account. And it's in this situation that uh, Isaiah has a word for Ahaz, uh, a word from God, a word from the Lord. Uh, and it's a very encouraging word. He speaks up and he says, uh, this is uh, verse 7 of the same chapter. The Sovereign Lord says about this, It will not place, take place. It will not happen. And he goes on to say that these two nations will soon be invaded themselves. And the threat to Judah will disappear. And then just to make this even more clear, he says, yeah, and um, uh, Yahweh, is, uh, the Lord, is prepared to give you a sign. A, a boy will be born. And before that boy knows his right hand from his left, that is when he's still very young, this threat will disappear. So there's a little time sequence here. And furthermore, the name of this boy is Emmanuel, God with us. Now, as I say, that must be very encouraging for Ahaz if he was listening. He's not very good at listening. Um, but um, that sign, as we know, a young woman shall bear a son, um, was taken up in the New Testament. And uh, applied to Jesus and the name God with us was wonderfully appropriate to Jesus. Well more about the fulfillment of the prophecy of, of the Isaiah prophecies in a minute. Now Isaiah didn't actually leave it there. I think perhaps whether it was at this point or 
Later on, he began to think to himself, yeah, but what if we had a real king? A king who was a little bit different from Ahaz. Ahaz hadn't responded at all well to the situation. When God offered a sign, he said, no, I don't want a sign, and so on. Uh, and we read in uh, Isaiah chapter 9, uh, the something better, the better king, that um, Isaiah knew that God was promising his people. And that was our main reading today. Let's just, just look at that uh, passage for a minute. It's uh, Isaiah 9, 2 to 7. Uh, it speaks about uh, the darkness coming to an end and, and there being light. The people who lived in darkness have seen a great light uh, and they were living in the shadow of death and they were going to be delivered from that. And, and the nation would rejoice at these new things, these wonderful new things, or, or perhaps at the wonderful new king, because that's what he's coming on to. And the day of oppression would be over. Now, here he quotes from the story of Gideon, which is a familiar story from the book of Judges, and mentions the Midianites. The Midianites were uh, roving people who descended on you just when you were not looking for them to come, when, when the harvest was ready, for example, and stole your crops and made off again. And actually they oppressed Israel in that way for many years. You remember Gideon was raised up by God to deal with it. But what God says, you know, no, 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 those sorts of oppressive situations, enemy situations, will be no more. Indeed, war will be no more. And uh, it very graphically talks about how the, the blood-stained clothing and the weapons of war will be rolled up and put together and burnt. You won't need weapons of war uh, anymore because there will be no more, more war. Oh, as the Negro Spiritual says, we're going to study war no more. So under this king, there's going to be peace. And the king himself will grow into an ideal king, a wonderful counsellor, a mighty God, meaning somebody who's endued with the power of God, an everlasting father who will look after his children, the Prince of Peace. And this will be God's doing. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And uh, there it is. It's a, it's a wonderful prophecy and we use it regularly at Christmas time. And we do that rightly because Isaiah was perhaps hoping for a king in his day, but he probably knew that this was an ideal picture which would never be actually fulfilled in his day. Ahaz's son was Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was a good king. We still refer to him as good king Hezekiah. But good king as he was, he never matched up to Isaiah's vision. And subsequent kings were a lot worse than useless, with the possible exception of uh, Josiah, they were a bad lot all the way through to the exile. Now, what we have here is a messianic vision, a vision of the ideal king who would put everything right. And um, that was in the future. Now, we know, and rightly, again, I, I would stress this, we apply this messianic prophecy to the Messiah, Jesus, in some detail. 
For example, when Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, in Matthew 4, um, Matthew quotes that opening uh, sentence, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and so on. And uh, we use this passage regularly at Christmas because it, it applies to our King Jesus. It's important to remember that we're still in a prophetic situation ourselves. Um, I was uh, doing a Zoom discussion this week, uh, 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 watching a, a, a YouTube, you know, watching a clip of, um, well, we had watched a clip of two uh, Jewish folk uh, debating with each other uh, and then we, we were discussing it together. And what were they were debating? They were debating was, has the Messiah actually come? And uh, one uh, rabbi said, no, he hasn't. We're still waiting. And the other, who was a Messianic Jew, uh, that is uh, a follower of Jesus, said, of course, yes, he's come. And there are prophecies to prove it. I think, uh, you, you won't be surprised if I say I think the latter was right. We're still in a prophetic situation, despite the fact that Messiah has come. It's wonderful that he has, but it's also true that we await even better news. We have wonderful blessings because because the Messiah has come and, and, as it were, we're part of his team. We can follow Jesus now. We, we can get to know him better. We belong to his body, the church. He's, he saved us and we can live without fear of death. And, and we can be members of an eternal kingdom. All that's true. But it's also true, friends, that there is more to come. The now of Jesus as Messiah has yet to give way to the not yet of our expectation. And when we, we sing, Thy kingdom come, O Lord, thy reign on earth begin, that's quite okay. When we, we pray, your kingdom come, we know that it hasn't fully come. We know that Every knee has not yet bowed to Jesus and, and, and confessed him as Lord. We know that the coming kingdom will be wonderfully glorious in, in, in probably a, a more uh, personal and physical sense. And um, next week we're going to be looking at uh, another vision of Isaiah's, this time of the peaceable kingdom. So we've much to look forward to, but much to enjoy now. And so I want to finish by um, just looking again at this wonderful passage in, in uh, chapter 9 and applying it to, to King Jesus as a, as a sort of ascription of praise to um, our Messiah King and applying it to ourselves as well. Just let me read this to you. We, your people, once walked in darkness, indeed in the land of shadows, but we have seen a great light and you have given us great joy. We were oppressed by our own sins apart from anything else, but you've broken the bonds of oppression. We were often at war with others, with ourselves, but now that's over. 
because a king has been given us. A wonderful ruler, powerful and peaceful. And we need never look for anybody else. This is your doing, Lord, and it is marvellous in our eyes. Amen.
As we come to communion now, we come to remember the King of Kings and what he has done for us so that we could confidently sing, reign in me. This new kingdom proclaimed with peace and justice in Christ's words and actions, culminating in violence to him. But only in this violent act could Jesus bring in permanently the new kingdom, bring God's light into the darkness of this world and continue it through us, his followers. So let's take a moment to reflect on this sacrament of sacrifice for our salvation. Lord, we thank you that you left heaven and came as that baby to be one of us, grew up in a true human being, shedding God's light all around, to all who would accept you. Then you willingly gave up your life to great suffering and death on the cross. That perfect person dying for the imperfect me, for us, for all of humanity, past, present and future, paying the cost in full of our rebellion against God, our sin, paid paid for by your death. And now, as we remember this sacrifice for us, we say, Father, forgive us. Father, accept us. Father, thank you for Jesus and what he has done for us. Amen. Come to this table, not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come, not because of any goodness of your own that gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come, because you love the Lord a little and would love to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. Lord, we give you thanks as we come to remember you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus took bread and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in memory of me. And he broke the bread. Please take your bread and eat in remembrance that Christ died for you. And feed on him in your heart with thanksgiving. Amen. In the same way after supper, Christ took a cup and said, This cup is a new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink it, do it in memory of me. Take your cup and drink this, remembering that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Holy God, 
we have been nourished and had our thirst quenched through broken bread and wine poured in thanksgiving for your Son, Jesus Christ. Send us out to be generous to those we meet this week that we might show through word and deed that he is not dead but risen and present among us King of Kings, Light of the World. Hallelujah. Amen. Bob will now bring us our intercessory prayers. Lord Jesus, we thank you and we praise you that you, Almighty God, are interested in the hopes and prayers of us mere mortals. And we, being, and we bring these concerns of ours to you in the knowledge that you care. Firstly, we give thanks. In fact, we rejoice that a vaccine may be imminent in the fight against coronavirus and pray for the work of scientists, as we do for all frontline workers who put their lives at risk every time they go to work. We pray that this lockdown may drive down infection rates, particularly in areas of high infection and among students. We do lift to you any who find isolation has a heavy impact on their mental health and well-being. Help us to recognise those who need extra care, a phone call or a gesture of love and care, for example. We pray for the people and government of America, for a peaceful transition of power and for the coming together of people with very different views for a greater degree of tolerance, not only among themselves, but for the planet. We continue to pray for the war-torn areas of the world, particularly the Middle East, and for the outbursts of terrorism experienced in, El in Europe and elsewhere. We pray not only for peace, but also for justice. Lord, we pray for those imprisoned for their faith. Indeed, for all political and faith prisoners, we pray for their sanity and resolve in such conditions. We pray for the work of Open Doors and others as they campaign on their behalf. I particularly pray for the release of Nazini uh, Ratcliffe, held in Iran as a bargaining hostage in our ongoing dispute with Iran. As we celebrate the beauty of the natural world this autumn, I give thanks that the front of our church has been, or, have been adorned with a rain garden, a small reminder of our need for a green revolution, where the footprint of the human race is compatible with the sustainability of the planet. We welcome America back to the Paris Climate Accord, but remember that we all have a part to play in living sustainably. May we tread lightly upon this earth. Creator God, hear our prayers and strengthen us to serve you in our care of your creation. Lastly, we pray for ourselves. For those struggling with health issues, bring healing. For those struggling with family issues, bring pre peace and resolution. For those longing to meet up with family and friends, bring patience. For those struggling with unemployment or loss of income, bring compassion. For those feeling lost and isolated, bring hope. We bring these prayers to you, Jesus, the Saviour of the world. Amen.
Blessings abound where'er he reigns. The prisoner leaps to lose his chains. The weary find eternal rest and all the sons of want are blessed. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you have blessed us and freed us and refreshed us and met our needs. Go with us now as the week unfolds, we pray. Amen. Let's say the grace together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen.